Ever heard the term indigo, crystal, rainbow, star? These names have become synonymous with what many believe to be a new kind of human. They are exceptionally bright, multidimensional, have psychic capacity, and even speak of having direct extraterrestrial connections. These new humans, many still children, are perhaps the most misunderstood among modern society. But their mission is clear, to help humans on this planet to evolve. This according to renowned ET contact researcher and regression therapist, Mary Rodwell. In this, our third interview with Mary, we cover a multiplicity of angles to this all-important subject. Taken together, what is spelled out is clear. We have in our midst right now, the new human. Mary, you just returned from a big conference in Melbourne, uh, the Afterlife Explorers Conference, in which you gave a stunning presentation on what we're going to be discussing today. And that's the star children or star seeds, as you've referred to them. Who are they? Why are they here now? And how do we begin to understand the reality of their presence in order to begin the process of planetary transformation? Big questions. But before we get into the meat of the discussion, tell us about the conference. How was it? Actually, it was brilliant. It was brilliant because for me, whenever I get an audience that isn't ufological based, in other words, you know, those um, that my main audience is those that have experiences with um, UFOs, um, encounters with different beings that are not as we would see them as, you know, the angelic or spirit guides. Um, A lot of those within the metaphysical fraternity that are interested in everything to do with afterlife, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, shamanic experiences, or um, any type of psychic experiences, often these audiences don't really understand the connection and Mm. the spiritual connection between, you know, um, everything to do with extraterrestrial encounters. Hmm. So for me to have an opportunity to show the connection um, was, um, you know, it was very, very important because um, with all of this, and again, because it's not understood by metaphysical groups or spiritual groups, often as not, is that many of my clients have um, experiences such as past life recall. Yeah. They will have near death experiences. About thirty-eight percent of those that have encounters have had near death experiences, mm-hmm. out of body experiences, for example. Um, understanding that they've been having past lives on other planets, so they will relate to different planetary systems, etc. And I even showed a, a wonderful young woman who spoke not only about her encounters at this moment in time with various ambassadors, as she calls them, from other star systems which she draws. And what, what's fascinating is that she, she says these aren't just drawings of, of um, a type of being from that place. They're real people. They're ones that she actually interacts with. So, you know, they are real in terms of how she understands. She also spoke of her time at Atlantis, where she mm-hmm. remembers a- a- being at the point where Atlantis went down. And she described it. All I can say is that what I heard from the organizers afterwards, they were bowled over Mm -hmm. by the numbers that said that this was the highlight for them of the conference. So it was really wonderful to know that my material actually resonated and people got it and they sure did. That's that's fabulous. I think perhaps, Mary, that these making this connection is striking a chord with a lot of people. I think, you know, one of the reasons, there are many reasons why I love your work, but one thing I love so much is that you are really helping to bring people, if you will, out of the closet of what's going on or really helping them to make sense of what's going on and drawing correlations between uh, the ET presence, we call it that loosely, I think it's much bigger, and uh, things like, uh, you know, the other side, if you will, the afterlife, near-death experiences, all of those sort of... um, metaphysical aspects. Uh, There is a common thread. So that's fabulous. That's fabulous. Well, you know, I'd like to begin um, on an aspect of your work that you have just spent so much time uh, delving into, and that's the star children. This has increasingly piqued my interest. Uh, 
one part that uh, there are many sort of dimensions, if you will, to this, but the autism part is, uh, or the, the connection uh, between these star children and autistic characteristics is very, very uh, fascinating to me. You know, I want to address the misunderstanding, what I think is a misunderstanding of, quote, autism as a dysfunction. I want you to give me your thoughts on what you feel is really going on. But before we do, Mary, I'd like to reference this quote uh, by someone whom you know that you've referenced, uh, Dr. Olson. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Dr. Olson, mm-hmm. PhD, who's a molecular, molecular biologist. Uh, you've had occasion to get to know. Here's what she says. She says, quote, the programs such as ADD, ADHD, Asperger's, quote, letter people, I do not believe are broken or dysfunctional genes, but instead they offer new multidimensional skills to prevent limited reprogramming of a third dimensional reality. The letter people show an impairment in communication between the brain halves and thus use one side of the brain for solving the same problem. Although it is thought that they are dysfunctional, however, it may be a way to free more space in the brain for solving difficult tasks. The Asperger part might be responsible for higher knowledge not interested in traditional learning. That's a mouthful, but I'd love for you to comment on that. Well, this is the brilliant um, part of my work is when I have come to a certain hypothesis or conclusion, somehow the universe provides me with corroboration Mm. and I've got two molecular biologists that are saying basically the same thing. Dr. Lena Olsen, I actually met and stayed with for a week in Sweden. Mm -hmm. She's an amazing lady who with her own encounters and she's um, interacted with uh, about 12 different inter, uh, you know, interdimensional or extraterrestrial beings. And this is experiential in the sense of this is her own experience, but also as a scientist, she's noticed that she herself has extra nerve endings on, on, um, uh, on, under her skin that she can see um, more spectrum of colors that she can hear um, uh, um, more uh, at the more auditory scale than most people. So these are very much her own personal experiences as a letter person mm-hmm. um, and how she's understood it because she's done the testing to see what it is that's happening with letter people in, 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 in terms of their awareness and why it's so difficult for them to marry their experiences with a 3D world where they're supposed to understand is the only reality. And this is why it's so difficult because they're bombarded with so much more information mm-hmm. than the rest of us. And, and that is yeah. the, the, the problem with it. And, and the clue with that was also meeting Neil Gold, who wrote the book Close Encounters of, of um, the ADHD kind. And right. he said, you know, he actually says, um, his name for ADHD is always dialed into higher dimensions. That's right. I saw that. I wanted to bring that up. Yeah. It's brilliant. It's fabulous. It brilliant? That's what it really because means. It, yeah. It is exactly what it is. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I wanted to talk about Neil a little bit. I wanted to ask you, is Neil the gentleman that I believe you had referenced that was he one of the earlier people that came to you with these sort of anomalous visits that were going on where he was getting marks in his body, waking up with marks? Is that the same person or am I thinking of somebody else? Um, there's someone else. I actually um, got to meet um, Neil because he's a UFO researcher in Hong Kong ah. and runs a group there. And he's seen many craft over Hong Kong, for example. I mean, he's originally from South Africa, um, but ended up in Hong Kong as a businessman there. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he's taken footage of craft and very, very um, passionate about putting this information out there. Mm. But the clue was when I stayed there um, under his invite and that UFO group where he said, Mary, I've always seen reality differently and I didn't even know what Mm. ADHD was. I only got diagnosed with that later on in life. How old was he when he was diagnosed with ADHD? It was in his 50s. Really? When he finally realized um, that... And the clue was that he said, Mary, I've always seen reality differently. Mm. And, you know, it's what I'm looking for with such a complex subject is always patterns of experience. What is that actually saying? And the reason that I came to the conclusion of all these so-called dysfunctions was I couldn't work out that if these um, different beings are upgrading humanity as they appeared to be doing with everyone who had encounters, they became more aware, more psychically aware, more intuitive, for example, and um, 
not only that intellectually um, and academically um, brighter mm -hmm. through their experiences, why would they have, you know, a child that was Asperger's or ADHD or any of these other so-called dysfunctions if we're being upgraded? It didn't make any sense until I worked out that this actual upgrading is about um, us not being so easily conditioned or programmed mm -hmm. into a limited and limiting 3D reality, which we know is a box mm -hmm. that most of us have been programmed into. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you just touch on a lot of things. We're going to get into We're going to get into the meat of it, folks, because there are many dimensions to this. This is something that I want so desperately for our uh, wonderful parents out there to pay attention to, uh, looking for the clues and really sort of reframing the, that's what I call big misunderstanding. So let's let's go to this. I'm going to stay on the autism thing for a little bit. This whole idea of autism and the incredible, incredible spike in numbers of autistic children in recent years has definitely confounded me. And this is why, Mary, there are two arguments that are taking place right now simultaneously in the alternative community. And I have been so wanting to pose this question to someone like you who's tuned in on both sides. Here it is. In one camp, particularly of uh, those who feel that the population is purposely being poisoned, and I think that there's something to that, that we're being bombarded with environmental conditions, our food and water supply, the vaccines, et cetera, to completely undermine our human physiology and psychology. But particularly, it's said that this is, this is the reason we are seeing such a spike in diagnosed cases of autism. Now, the other side of the discussion is focusing more on autism, like yourself, not as a disorder per se, but rather a brand new type of human, even superhuman, multidimensional being. Could it be that both are true or some combination of the above scenarios? I've racked my brain trying to understand what's going on here, and I'd love to get your thoughts. Was I clear on that, on the two sides that we're talking yes. about? Mm. And, it, and it's certainly um, one that I have looked at. I don't know ultimately, and I don't know anyone um, that fully knows um, what the vaccines are doing. Mm -hmm. um, and But I do think, and I, you know, people must make up their own mind. I do believe that there's a darker agenda with a lot of the vaccines now. And I don't, um, and I am very wary, let's put it like this, of anything mm -hmm. to do with vaccines. And this is an ex-nurse midwife speaking here, right. um, who was totally programmed into vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. But I do know there's another another level to this that I don't think the general public know about. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not that's instrumental in some way in uh, the the spike of autism, I, I don't have the information and yeah. enough um, data to actually qualify that. Yeah. But I will say that I'm talking about certain types of autism. Mm. And what what we're seeing is many of these autistic children are almost like savants. And the interesting thing with, and, and I also know a medical doctor researching this at the moment who, who can't, for lots of reasons, come out and say this yet, but her research is showing that autistic children are telepathic. And now this is, this is what she's, she's discovering. Now, um, I also believe, that, and, and certainly certain parents that have written to me saying, I believe my child is telepathic. They know and, and say, say things, or at least they seem to be aware of what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. My feeling is that the autistic child also, or at least some of them, are taking us to another level where we're going from um, verbal communication to mm -hmm. telepathic communication. So they're the, the next level, if you like. And the reason that they often act um, in the way that they do, I think is an overload of sensory input. And secondly, because they're telepathic, if a mother or father is getting frustrated because they're trying to communicate and the child doesn't understand or the child is being overwhelmed, their frustration will also be part of why the child may react in the way that they do because the child is getting frustrated too. It wants to be able to convey things, doesn't know how to do it, is, yeah. is um, completely overwhelmed by sensory um, overload. So you get, you know, extreme reactions, understandably so. Mm -hmm. My feeling is from a metaphysical point of view, they're teaching us how to love unconditionally because ultimately with these children, they are, there's only one real way to communicate and that's through love. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that there's a, you know, that's how I understand it from a spiritual perspective. But I also, you know, understand now that these children, um, most likely most of them are telepathic. And we have to be careful of our thoughts. We have to sure be do. careful of what we're conveying. Because this is teaching us, too, that our thoughts um, actually affect our environment around us that are sensed and felt by these sensitive children and we have to be very aware that they can tune into what we're thinking our frustrations our angst our own personal issues and we'll con- get confused mm-hmm. between u- us and them so if they're close to a mother who's unhappy or frustrated or whatever they will take on board that in- that um, emotion and that energy and they will manifest it too because they don't always know what's there issue and what's the parents issue until they learn the difference yeah so these are all things that i've come to understand uh, about the autistic child and there's so much more than that but that's an overview Mm -hmm. well that's a good overview something to take note of and as you're describing that i think i I don't know that i've ever thought of it in that way that um the telepathic connection to that extent um but now that you mention it you know and i'm thinking of several who doesn't know several uh, autistic uh, children these days, some aspect of it. And I'm constantly making mental note of some of the, the, uh, the common threads that exist, including hypersensitivity, sensitivity to noise, uh, you know, uh, agitation. And I'm also, I also know their parents and I'm looking at some of the histories of their parents and some of the stress they're going through. We're talking about uh, children that aren't just, tuning in on one level to the angst that may be coming from their parents, but literally taking it on and not, like you said, not able to differentiate perhaps maybe some can, maybe not. So if for no other reason, parents, if you feel that this is happening, this is why this is such an important conversation. You're right, Mary, there are a lot of, a lot of dimensions to this. I want to make reference uh, to Dr. Olson again, who had a really great little sort of recipe in terms of um, the need, first of all, for extra nutrients and vitamin supplements to to deal for these uh, particular individuals to deal with this 3D reality. Among other things, she mentioned, I think, the B vitamins um, uh, and a few other things, but she suggests silica gel for the stomach and nervous system and a probiotic for intestinal flora. Now, this is why I want to, excuse me, bring this up. That particular recommendation sort of struck a chord with me because I'm hearing so much now about more people having chronic issues with their gut and their stomach, including me. And so my question to you is that, could it be that what's happening is that more people, adults included, or at least their bodies are gaining some form of memory that they too may have this connection, this star connection. And the body is now telling them by giving them more problems, particularly in the gut area, which of course aligns with what? The solar plexus. I don't know. As I was reading this, I, my mind kind of wandered a bit. I don't know if this is a stretch, but it occurred to me. I think it's important, Alexis, too, because I know that you're extremely intuitive, that when those, uh, uh, you might think they're random thoughts, but actually you're putting out a frequency and you're trying to, on some multidimensional level, see where it resonates or, or what information it pulls in. I think you need to listen to that. And mm-hmm. I'm always saying, if something comes in in that way, it's often, you know, that multidimensional intuitive part of you bringing in information. What I think is tied into this is that all those new programs, as I call them, they're a different frequency. And so the foods that maybe you had um, uh, you know, earlier in your life that you were okay with, mm. you may find that as your frequency changes and your awareness grows, you will want different things um, to uh, different nutrients. Many people find themselves going more to vegetarianism, for example, or whatever, um, refining the kinds of foods they have, wanting more liquid food, for example, and what have you. So this is really what the gut's telling you, often mm-hmm. as not, is that this is no longer fitting with your frequency. I think you're right, yeah. So that's that's how I've come to understand it, you know, that we've got to listen to what our biological systems as it's changing. Um, and, and Dr. Olson talks about low frequency people and high frequency people and how we're separating out into those two frequencies and depending on your choices and where you wish to understand yourself or to grow will be part of this this frequency change and food is part of that as well. Mm-hmm. Remember that the ADHDs they're operating on a um, a, a faster man um, frequency. You know that you know that's why they struggle at school because everything's so pedestrian, so slow mm-hmm. that they give them Ritalin to slow them down so they can match 
you know, yeah. the, the frequency of everyone else or the, you know, whatever, but actually their, that, their real place in terms of operating is, is much faster consciousness, faster frequency. And, and with that goes different kinds of things you need to support it so that they can manage. You know, if you're operating, your biological system's operating on a faster, um, if you like, biological uh, mandate, if you like, um, then you're going to uh, find that you need more of certain things to balance you out in this particular uh, reality um, construct mm -hmm. that we're in. And <laughs> it's certainly, like it's certainly not Ritalin. Oh boy, is that how why primarily Ritalin is used to slow down these sort of how what society looks as just these hyper kids? Is that the primary yeah. really? Uh, I don't know absolutely, I... it's it's the only way they can slow up their mind and their <sighs> their consciousness, so that they can. It's almost like you know you, you're winding down the clock so that they can then see 3D world and manage 3D world. But that's actually what you're doing. That is why, you know, um, they say they can focus and have more con concentration because that's the reality that they're being slowed in, um, put into. Mm. But actually, they are operating on a far higher speed. And, and they're, they're, it's like they're in a, a slow world, you know, a world that's going slowly. And they're wanting to see the, you know down the track and they're, they're being saying, no, no, you've got to see it this way. It's right. really slow. And, and that's the frustration is sure because is. that's not the way their brain works. No, not at all. Oh boy. I really something to think about here. And I want to get into toward the end, what on earth, I always say what on earth or beyond uh, society, what we can, where we can start. Let's save that for the end. Cause there's so much in between. I'm going to touch on uh, Neil Gold for one more moment before we move on. Um, you know, he believes that there's literally a genetic modification, a genetic modification that's taking place when the child is still in utero. I've heard this before. I want to talk about for a moment, what's happening there. And even more importantly, who or what is doing the modifying if that's happening? Absolutely. Um, what I'd like to say, um, my, my first, uh, uh, if you like, scientist that could give me information on that, which was something I was actually told about by an experience, a young lady called Tracy Taylor um, in 2000, was that these new children were coming in and this is, they had certain qualities, for example, but I had no way of qualifying that in 2000. And it was in around about 2010 when I connected with Dr. William Brown, a molecular biologist mm. in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And he, um, he's a, a, an amazing gentleman. Um, he's into consciousness as well. And I asked him about this. Did he, from his perspective, have an understanding of this? And he said, absolutely. He said, and he believed that it was genetic modification and it was happening in utero, producing new humans. That was the word he used. And he said that their new genetic architecture allows them to see the world in a multidimensional fashion. Mm -hmm. And research would show that dormant genetic regions are being integrated into the biological systems, systems occurring in all of us to produce expanded awareness. And he was saying the exponential increase in ADD, autistic, indigo children, their brains work faster. They already know what they're being taught. They have an intrinsic understanding of knowledge and information at biomolecular level and transgenerational information encoded within the atomic structure of the DNA and can it be ac accessed you know, by them more efficiently to pr produce savant-like characteristics. And it's like a remodeling of the genome to make dormant regions accessible again. Now, this blew me away because this was basically what Tracy Taylor had told me 10 years prior to this. Mm -hmm. um, he, he goes into more, more of that in his, um, he's, he's got a website called um, William Brown Science of Life. And he goes into this from a scientific, but also metaphysical point of view as well. But then I get Dr. Olson, who is really reiterating exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I, um, what I've got in my book too, with this information, I had a, 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 a good friend now who is part of FREE, who's an astrophysicist, Dr. Rudy Shield, has um, looked at this information as an astrophysicist. And actually, you will see his comments on this information where he concurs from his perspective as an astrophysicist. So I've got three scientists all saying the same thing, all mm. highly credentialed, that are qualifying what Tracy had said to me from 
her understanding of her communication with the beings, identical information hmm. that is saying exactly what we're talking about. Wow. Okay. Well, that's something to chew on as well. So I guess what the inference is, Mary, that because the latter part of my question was who who is doing the modifying? So suffice it to say, it is the various beings that th these these souls are a part of to begin with that are doing the modifying in utero? Yes, and it's, it seems to be on multiple levels. On and multiple depend levels. Hmm. It depends on whether you are connected to one particular star system or um, particular being from, and we're talking about not just in this universe, that mm. what we're hearing is dimensions. People, um, I, I had a 10 year old tell me that he came through a portal in the sun, mm -hmm. that there are other dimensions, other universes, for example, and it seems like many of them have volunteered to come to this planet to assist in its transition, mm -hmm. to assist in changing the mindset to a higher awareness, which, you know, is a, a consciousness shift. And for that, they need upgraded biological systems, which particular beings will assist in. And that may be at the moment of conception, where I've had um, parents, you know, mothers say, I was told my child was different. I knew they were going to be a special child and would have perhaps an encounter at the very time this child was conceived. And what is also bizarre, and people can make their own conclusions on that, sometimes they have had a child and they have not been aware that they have had any, uh, any well, they've said they've had no sexual um, intimacy and suddenly find themselves pregnant. So really? You can, Immaculate yes. conception we're talking yes. about. Yes, no, I'm, wow. and, and oh, you know, boy. people are going to struggle perhaps with this, but they've mm. said, look, you know, I don't know how I got pregnant because at that time I was separated from my partner, da, 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 and then I find myself pregnant and cannot explain it. So nothing is impossible with these beings in terms of what they can do if they want a particular um, soul um, with particular skills and awareness um, they will be able to um, if you like uh, facilitate that child coming to this planet at this time now we're getting into a whole <laughs> whole another dimension of questions we may have to do a show just on this one, Mary. I mean, I, just so you know, uh, the audience may know I'm getting ready to interview Barbara Lamb, your your good colleague, while, I, while I'm out in California, and uh, we'll be talking about hybrid beings. But of course, as you bring this to mind, this idea of perhaps becoming impregnated without uh, any sort of sexual intercourse brings that to mind you know, where is the conception actually taking place on what dimension uh, or or planet or, or whatever is it taking place? How's that happening? And are these kids now we're getting to this idea that are they completely human to begin with? Um, so all those questions are, are just up on the board. <laughs> it's, it's really... Oh boy. Okay. All right. We're gonna re we're gonna revisit that one. Audience, I really want you to listen carefully to what Mary is saying. Let me ask you... I, how often have you come across that anomaly of, you know, those who got pregnant feeling that it was an immaculate conception, so to speak? There, it, it's not a high percentage, um, but there's certainly, if, if I could say of all the, I mean, I've worked with over 3,000 individuals now, I would say probably the ones that have owned it, and remember the ones that own it and the ones that don't could change that kind of percentage but i would say uh maybe up three four five percent would really? say that they they uh, i mean one one lady told me that she went to the um, gynecologist and he was he was um looking at her uterus and he said how many pregnancies have you had and this is a lady who was celibate that were, had never had <laughs> any pregnancies at all but he had noticed um and and said but you you know your your uterus looks as though you've had several pregnancies so this is the missing pregnancy syndrome, which is in my book, Awakening. And mm. this is another aspect which brings in the hybrids, of course, and those that believe that they're hybrids. And, and that's mm -hmm. another aspect, not only of my work, but of course, um, the latest book that Barbara's written about the hybrids. So it that's all right. ties in. Mm -hmm. It all ties in. Yeah, it sure does. Okay. Yeah. Her book, I believe, was released, uh, oh, just a month or so ago, if not, uh, she co-authored the book, actually. 
And, That's uh, right. We'll be talking about that. I'll actually be interviewing her at her home outside of L.A. So great. Wow. All right, let's move on to the next little section here and see if we can, audience, tie all of this together. I really think this is the type of material, what we're discussing here, where you really need to sit in meditation, like you said, and, and kind of put that intuitive hat on or that sort of instinctual hat and say, where, where is the common thread here? Because I think they're all uh, related for sure. I want to talk about um, these children that are getting a sort of multidimensional training, what you call space schools. Now, our mutual colleague and my personal friend and mentor, PMH Adwater, who's also, and I believe she was at the the Afterlife Explorer Conference. <laughs> I think she's probably still in Australia. It just occurred to me because I emailed her and I'm like, hmm, she usually emails me right back. I have a feeling she and her husband are still in Australia. <laughs> anyway. Well, obviously, but, I, I saw her and she came up and <laughs> wanted my book and said, I want the new book. And I said, well, actually, it's not <laughs> written yet. So somebody gave her like... my first book, but it was really interesting to to knowing her perspective as well. And I was, I was actually looking to see what her reaction would be because of yeah. um, I add an, a whole new um, component to this. And she just says, no, I want the new book. She said to that me, sounds oh, well. just like the image. It's not an ask. It's a statement. I want the new, she's a love. Well, you know, she calls these kids, uh, Mary, the new children. She, in fact, she mm-hmm. tends to not like to use the, the labels. She says, toss those indigo star crystal, whatever, but we're all speaking the same lang- language. I think in any case, she calls them the new children. Um, and she's, I want to stay on the the, uh, the space schools for a little while because she has referenced as well these sort of off-planet learning environments. And I want to tell you, in fact, uh, one of our interviews, I've had her on the show quite a few times. She told the story, listen to this, of two young boys. She was in the mall uh, and saw two young bo- uh, boys who met in the mall. with They were with their parents. Neither had met in real life, but immediately they recognized each other when they were walking in sort of the mall sort of corridor, came face to face. They they embraced each other and I think called each other by name. And PMH is just kind of watching this interaction. The parents are going, what the heck? In fact, I think um, one set of parents were... Uh, visiting the area. They were tourists and they were had never been there before. The other set of parents and their little boy n- lived there. Okay. So, but these two kids came together, embraced each other, and they started talking about having been in night school together the night before. And they were even discussing the lessons that w- they were being taught. How about that for corroboration on what you're talking about? It, it's absolutely brilliant. And mm-hmm. I've got in one of the chapters, two young girls, both seven years old, both um, two of them live um, in the US, but one actually in Melbourne, in, in Australia. And the two, what one, both of them talked about was going to on space school to Mars um, with aliens and, you know, in, with ETs and other human children and what they were taught. And one of them had a symbol that she'd seen on the walls and had seen on the craft and was wanting to know more about it. So I actually sent this symbol to the other young seven-year-old that I knew mm. that had also said the same thing about going to Mars on a spacecraft, describing what it was like, what Mars was like, the domes she saw on Mars. And she said, this is what the symbol means. I sent this back to the other family um, and said, this is the understanding. And the little seven-year-old from the other family said, she's absolutely correct. That's exactly what that symbol means. And that was what I was taught on the craft as well. So you've got this corroboration from two seven-year-olds that have both talked about going to space school uh, on Mars and their experience of it and actually recognizing the same symbol that they'd seen on the craft. Okay. I don't know quite what to say here other than I just, as you're talking, I'm thinking to myself, forgive me if I just take a moment. This is way too important, all of this, to ignore anymore. We have got to start taking all of this seriously and giving it the attention it deserves. There is something extraordinary going on that's been going on. And I just want, I get, you know, sometimes I get a little emotional because it's important. This is the real news, not this other stuff. Okay. Um... Well, you know, let's stick with the, 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 these learning environments. Uh, you mentioned some of these kids having gone to the ocean floor, underground bases. Have they described any of these, Mary, with any detail to you? 
Well, I, I did have one young man, and this goes into the conspiratorial side mm. of it, where he was taken to a base where he said there was a, a lady in a military uniform in front of him, and she had technology to one side, and he was in a chair. And she was trying, with this technology, to bring down his frequency to not only um, find out information from him, but also to put information into his head. And he said, and I wouldn't let her do it. I kept my frequency to a point. She didn't know I was doing it, but I was able to keep my frequency at a higher level so most of the time she couldn't get anything from me and also she couldn't put anything into my head but he knew it was wrong he knew what she was doing was not for his benefit at all mm -hmm. and this goes into this whole thing about some of these children being targeted if you like mm -hmm. and appropriated by certain covet groups that know about their abilities, know what they can do on this planet. That's right. I'm so glad you brought that up because you were reading each other's mind because I was going to go right in there. Again, there is no demarcation between any of these aspects. They're all connected, I think. Let me just go right to this. Okay. You mentioned that many of these kids are, in fact, acutely aware of covert programs and hidden agendas. And I want to talk about that for, for a bit. Let's just segue. Do you think, Mary, the perpetrators whomever they may be, of the hidden and covert agendas that are existing, have been for, for a long time, are in fact aware of these star new children. I think you're alluding to that they are, that they're aware. And if so, do you think that they're trying to find out or find, I should say, methods to neutralize them in various ways? I think this is what we're getting to, including, including through the various vaccinations and food and public schooling. In other words, products of modern society, could they be, in fact, mechanisms to try to keep these new children dumbed down? Absolutely. I, I've got a whole ch um, one chapter of a young nine-year-old telling me exactly that. And he said that they have, um, they do pick these children up, they go and take them to underground bases, and they um, work with their abilities, but they're not doing it for the benefit of the rest of the children or the rest of mankind. Right. They are absolutely aware that these children are everywhere. And mm. this young nine-year-old knew about it. Another nine-year-old in Northern Europe, a young girl, was also saying it's exactly the same thing. She was um, that they are aware of what, how they're being programmed. They're aware that we're being conditioned into old mindsets. They're aware that they can be targeted. And uh, uh, one of them actually told me the reason he spoke to me and not to anyone in the U.S. is because he didn't feel it was safe to talk to anyone in the US that he had to speak to me really? in Australia because he felt safer. They are absolutely aware and I'm, I, I'm making no apologies in my book for mentioning some of the things that they are saying that these covert agencies are doing and believe me it's not for humanity's benefit it's more for the agendas of certain elite on this planet and you know I have to say that because that's the information that's coming out. And how, what, are, what would you say is the average age of these kids that are uh, <laughs> in, it, amazing from seven, eight, nine, ten, we've got children under 10 that know what's going on this nine year old told me that there is certain technologies both biological and electronic for mind control that is not just on this planet but also on the moon and on Mars and he, he said that this is all to do with controlling the populace, controlling the public um, now this is a nine year old telling me this, they are aware they know when they're being controlled they know um, very much if someone's lying to them mm -hmm. or not lying to them Right. You see, they're able to ascertain, um, ascertain this. Right, because of their uh, acute telepathic uh, abilities. Wow, it sounds like we're in a bit of a battle here, at least between them and who, those who don't wish well. Well, we, we've had many conversations about that, but when you hear it coming from a child who can not help but be incredibly honest, what, what can you say? And not just one, not just two, not just ten, how many? Um, well, let this takes us to the next thing, uh, which I think, again, we've alluded to throughout, and that is the incredible psychic abilities of these star children. What are you hearing and seeing in this regard? I want to emphasize seeing. Have you seen, Mary, anything that would defy uh, what the average person would say is logic that would be considered psychic? 
Oh, the abilities are literally multidimensional in nature because some of the syllabuses, as I call it, that are, they are taught how to manage these skills by different beings that become their teachers or they call them their friends or their guides. Um, and they will talk about the different abilities they are learning to control and understand, such as telepathy, mm. out-of-body training, how to use telekinesis, how to control with intent. I, I remember one of um, Dr. Olson told me that she found as a child that when she played hide and seek the best way not to be found was to tell the other children in her mind that they couldn't see her and she said they couldn't see her they literally couldn't see her because yeah. she could mind influence them to say you're not seeing me mm -hmm. so you know this, these are the kinds of things that you know I will be talking about in terms of the, you know the kinds of um, they can actually manifest through thought and emotion um, and m remote influence. Mm -hmm. All of these things they're taught often on spacecraft or in, in these other spaces where, you know, they, they're taught. Also, you know, when they come out with the scripts or the language, these are taught on the craft. And these are often star languages that um, will enable us when we're interacting with these beings that they will be able to um, speak their language. They will be able to communicate with them. And this is what all the star languages seem to be, although not all of them are linear. And this is another level that we're going to towards reaching t um, telepathic abilities ourselves. So these are all the kinds of things that they're being shown and taught in their space school, mm -hmm. for want of a better word. Mm -hmm. Well, again, going back to the space school, I wanted to just retouch on that as I, we sort of segued from what you call space school, what PMH is called night school, and then these sort of uh, learning environments, maybe it shouldn't be called that, on the ocean floor and underground bases. I would assume that these are not the same Right. The, you know, no, no. Okay. All right. I, no. I, I guess they're I not, sort of not say. Yeah. Okay. I misunderstood that. And that, that should definitely be made clear. Okay. All right. Well, we're good. We're going right through the list here. I'm glad because, um, and I'm going to have extensive notes, by the way, folks on, uh, my website, uh, Hydra News Radio, Hydra com. So please be sure to read through. There's another aspect, yet another that, um, occurred to me maybe intuitively, I don't know, that you and I conversed about uh, over email. And that's some, something that is referred to as synesthesia. This is the ability where, or, or the, the condition, we'll call it, or where certain individuals will associate one physical sense with another, like connecting days of the week with a certain color, or hearing hearing numbers, or smelling music. Just very, very um, unlikely connections of sensory um, processes. And this, of course, sounds extremely nonsensical to, to the average person, but there are people who report having these unusual connections, and it's well it's well known as a phenomenon in some circles. So it occurred to me as I was um, sort of musing over synesthesia, do you think that there may be a connection with people that have some of these characteristics and the group known as starseeds or new humans? I think absolutely, and it's a really good way of explaining that the way that we interpret our sensory input is in very clear um, lines of, you know, you see a color, you don't feel a color, you don't sense a color, you don't, um, you know, it. and it was fascinating to me that I've discovered that many star seeds, especially, you know, with artists, um, one artist told me that when she does her artwork, she doesn't go by the color. She goes by the feeling of the color. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, I've talked to young star seeds. One of them is an artist and told me he does exactly the same. So, yes, it's like our senses can give us um, a whole range of feelings and knowings um, around something that we would only see in, in one. Um, we experience only in one way, but they will in a multidimensional way. And again, I believe synesthesia is very much part of what many star seeds experience, even if they don't have a name for it, mm -hmm. but that's a really good one. That's a really good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you and I have talked about that. There's a little personal connection for me. I'm not going to go into that right now, but yeah, it, it, that has occurred to me. Synesthesia. There's another called pareidolia. I don't know if you and I had ever talked about that, where people will see uh, distinct uh, images in patterns. Um, and not necessarily, it's not something that they try to do. They just pop out at them, faces or animals or, you know. And, and I always find it funny um, that 
the field of psychology will, once they name it, right, synesthesia, pareidolia, uh, is a, is a, they, they sort of use it as a, um, a disorder or get, frame it as a disorder, I should say, or a, a problem <laughs> because it's not normal the way no- we consider normal to be. So I think uh, let's not miss the point on that. So folks, there are probably a lot of people out there that have some semblance of that and have maybe never questioned it. Well, maybe it's time to question it. So, okay. Well, I, we've been sort of talking about the extra, extraterrestrial mouthful connection, but I want to dig in a little bit more. Um, in the introduction to your new book, uh, which I can't wait to read the whole thing, you were kind enough to send me the introduction uh, to the book. And you listed several statements made by some of these children alluding to their origins uh, having been non-human. The mantids come up quite often uh, in relation to this human-non-human connection. What other beings have you run across, Mary, as being connected to these star children? Are you finding that there's certain groups that are that seem to come up more than others? Look, I think primarily the most are humanoid um, of, of various kinds. Um, you get what we call energy beings or light beings seem to be very common. Uh, many blue types of beings um, will be seen as either friends or guides or helpers or a part of their family. The mantid, you know, is a really strange one for many, um, many because they, do, they don't look particularly pretty to our human mm-hmm. eyes because they look very much like a, a, ma- a praying mantis. But when you have an eight-year-old telling you that that's his family, um, and he feels that he's going back into the mantid form when he dies and passes over hmm. and very emotional about it. This is really fascinating that they can connect to many other different life forms. Um, one of the young ladies I spoke at the conference says that the life form she most connects to is in a zoni where she's purpley, got purple skin. And she said, that's one of my favorite um, forms that I've been in, if you like. But the lion beings, felines, mm. many connect to them and feel that that's where their origin is with the felines, for example. Crystalline beings, um, many, there is just such a matrix mm-hmm. of different forms um, that, you know, from carbon based to silicon based to crystalline based, it doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be anything that cannot be. Um, accessed if you like but those open to it so we just have to understand Mm -hmm. that we live in a matrix or or universes or omniverse of many many different types of intelligence in many forms and and many of them can create the form um, that's comfortable for you as well just remember that what you're seeing may not be absolutely the true form Mm. they may put on a, a human form for you just to make you feel comfortable. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's, you know, apart from obviously different types of greys, tall whites, you know, it's it's absolutely incredible the different, I've seen those that have had art, you know, that are good with art. Some of the uh, uh, different types, uh, you know, even plant forms as well, you name it. It seems that our imagination can't even imagine. Can't even um, get our arms around it. Things. Yeah, that's exactly right. Oh sure. Oh, I think that there there could be an infinite amount and 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 so many um, variations. And you know, again, I've I've always been intrigued by the species, the what we loosely call ET species. Again, I think it's. We, we, I guess we need to have a label to be able to sort of frame it. Although I don't think it's just, certainly not just ETs, but. Many of them seem to mimic our animal kingdom, mantids, praying mantis, the feline beings, dolphins. And isn't it interesting that we live amongst these beings now? So here's a question that just came to me. For those particularly us humans who have an extraordinary affinity to, I don't know how many have pet (laughs) praying mantises, Mm -hmm. but let's just say cat lovers as an example. Now I know another mutual colleague of ours, Simon Parks, uh, who, by the way, uh, many of in our audience probably know Simon Parks and his connection with the mantids as well as the rep. Uh, reptilian beings, but he loves cats. I think he has, I think he said like nine cats. And I, have you know, kind of surveyed people and, and I love to, to meet other, I'm a cat person myself. You just wonder if people who have an affinity to a certain, even plants, you know, they talk to the plants, right? Sounds a little silly at mm-hmm. first, but when you dig a little bit deeper, Again, what are, what might we recognize in ourselves just by these things that we never really took that seriously? Oh, I adore cats or I adore 
talking to my plants, might we have a connection deeper than we think? I think you're absolutely spot on. And, the, uh, you know, that goes with past lives as well. If you find you're drawn to a particular country mm -hmm. or a particular time in history, it's most likely that you're connecting to that, that, that particular life or whatever it is. And I find that all the time with past life work is they'll say, oh, I've always been drawn to China or whatever. You can bet your bottom dollar that they'll have had a lifetime, you know, at that time that they've been drawn to or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the same goes, as you say, to being drawn to particular animals. There are many people that, you know, I love dolphins and mm -hmm. I've done regressions where one gentleman said that at the time of Atlantis, he wasn't on Atlantis, but he was a dolphin around that time. So he was actually, you know, that particular creature or being um, at, a, at the time of Atlantis. So, you know, it, it means that, that, you know, the soul can incarnate in many, many different forms. And there is no limits um, to what those forms might be in terms of, you know, experiencing that consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that. Sure do. Well, as suspected, the time has just flown by, <laughs> but I'm going to try to get a couple more things in, um, Mary, before we close. One of them that struck me is, again, these children that you're conversing with that are, uh, have been uh, so open in talking to you about their experiences and sharing their wisdom, their absolute wisdom. Uh, some of them have talked about suggestions. You know, we're talking about increasing our own energy. Our bodies are being affected. Uh, uh, we're being affected psychologically, emotionally, perhaps by those that have another agenda. But in any case, we need to increase our own energy level. They made the following suggestions. I think many of us have heard this, but to hear it coming from a child is especially uh, poignant. The list goes, don't get angry about small things. And I absolutely agree with that. Don't speak on mobile phones for long times. These are kids talking. No TV, no microwaves, no wireless internet. Those are three of, of I mm. believe, that the, some of these children have said. These are kids, once again, <laughs> that are making these statements. They know these things intuitively, I suppose. Absolutely. And, and they know why they've come. And they, they, the one thing that I still remember is being told that we must listen to them. Mm -hmm. We must listen to what they're teaching us because they're the teachers mm -hmm. and they have come to help us um, as a species um, become, you know, uh, more aware, more conscious. And I do believe ultimately, and we won't have time to talk it, about it now, but I believe we have to have a, ho a completely different educational system for oh, these absolutely. children. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, that was my, that was going to be my final question. As far as these children are concerned, for the sake of not only the children themselves, but humanity at large, Mary, what do you think needs to happen for society to begin the process of taking seriously that this is what's going on, that we're not dealing with some biological or neurological malady or disorder, but rather the entrance of a new kind of human. What do you think would be most apt to hear uh, this reality for what it is, or who I should say? Who who should we start to really broach the subject with? Teachers, parents, where do we start? Well, I've got many teachers writing to me telling me that they're aware that these kids are different and they're usually teachers that have had experiences themselves. And, you know, I've had um, a lady who was a kindergarten teacher, say her two-year-old was telling her about a drawing where he was going up to the stars and was doing a drawing of it and whatever. So a lot of the teachers, midwives that I've met, nurses, are very aware um, of not only their own experiences, but their midwif midwifing, if you like, mm -hmm. these new children. And they're aware that they're star kids so mm. we've got an underground if you like almost it sounds like it's covert program mm -hmm. uh, uh, from these beings that are uh, assisting us to wake up as a species and people are waking up around the planet now it is amazing the numbers that are writing to me emailing me and these are right across the board you know some of them are scientists you know doctors nurses psychiatrists clinical psycho psychologists that are having experiences and I and you know celebrities mm. all sorts of people now mm -hmm. are waking up to this the only thing is there's an elephant in the room mm. that nobody feels quite safe enough to say that that's the elephant I see. And that's what Dr. Lena Olson has done bravely as a scientist. She's come out the, the space closet and said, this is my experience and we need to have more of that. And I think it's going to happen. I love it. You know, we've got to, I, I, I 
always get so encouraged when I hear you reporting things like this, because, you know, let's face it, those of us that are really pl- place emphasis on these sorts of subjects, and there's a there's a gamut, um, and then you walk out your door and you see, you know, and uh, God love all people, but people that just spend so, so much time focused on superficiality and making that the priority. You walk outside your door and you see that you can get a little discouraged um, and you have to kind of talk to yourself and say, and, and I'm not the type of person to, to, to preach and, and rant because I, I, I really feel that people must walk their own walk and arrive if and when it's time for them to this sort of information. But uh, I'm always encouraged, uh, to, certainly when I'm speaking with you, Mary, to hear uh, all of the people that are coming to you with their stories. I think it's it's going to be a collection of experience and anecdotes, uh, not proof as you know we're used to seeing it. Uh, that's going to shift the paradigm, and we're seeing that. So, well, your your new book. When's it going to be released? The New Human, by the way, <laughs> is the title. Still working on a subtitle, but <laughs> when is it going to be released? I know everyone's going to want to grab a copy. Well, um, I'm aiming on certainly having it by mid year, if not earlier. Mm. I mean, I keep being pushed by. I call my non physical team to get my finger out um, and I'm doing my best to get my finger out and I'm trying to cut down my other work so that I can get this done and uh, I'm getting there so um, okay. I'm asking for the angels to, to to give me a hand as well I'm sure they will I know that probably I have a feeling they're going to nudge you even more after we get off <laughs> this call so <laughs> listen one more little announcement I am so excited. I'm going to put Mary on the spot, but she said I could mention it. Mary Rodwell will be a, uh, in the near term, a regular contributor to Higher Journeys, our our website, higherjourneys.com, where she will be uh, letting us know what she's up to. You're going to be getting little snippets of the book and just all the great research that she's compiled. She'll be putting it in the written form and we'll uh, periodically be writing uh, as a, a guest contributor. I'm not going to call you guests. You're, you're part of the family now of higherjourneys.com. So I want everyone to stay tuned for that. And as always, go to the Australian Close Encounter Resource Network. That's A-C-E-R-N dot, you have to help me, dot com dot A-U. Did I get that right? Okay, I got it right. Okay. (laughs) See, I'm doing the plug for you. So (laughs) (laughs) that's Mary's uh, wonderful website, always chock full of great information, as well as free. What's going on with free right now, Mary? Well, we're doing uh, very well. We should have the website up and running this month, all being well. And that's um, based in America, Mm -hmm. but we are having scientists and academics as part of a new way of getting credibility and creating the bridge Mm -hmm. now into the new paradigm. And that's what free is about. Lovely. And I know a lot of people are familiar with it. They've actually emailed me and said, when are we going to talk more about free? I want to know more about it. So people are definitely chomping at the bit to get more information on that. So much good stuff. Now, Mary, I don't want you to hang up, but we're going to sign off the air for now. I just want to say again, thank you. I always just, oh, what a treat to have you. Always love having you. And uh, there's never uh, a time when we won't have anything to talk about. There's just so much to get to and take very seriously. So thanks again for your contribution. Always a pleasure. Take care. Thank you again. Okay. Take care. The New Human is the title to Mary's forthcoming book in which she goes into excruciating detail about the who, what, how, and why these beings are amongst us today and what it is they know that they want to share with the rest of humanity. While we're patiently awaiting the release of what I know will be an extraordinary volume by Mary, I encourage you to visit her website, the Australian Close Encounter Resource Network, to stay up to date on Mary's ongoing research into what she refers to as star children, as well as her additional work centering around the ET contact phenomenon. I also invite you to visit higherjourneys.com to have an exclusive look at some original images Mary sent to us from an audience member who clearly saw non-human beings surrounding the stage as Mary gave a recent presentation in Melbourne, Australia. There's always something new and exciting to witness for yourself. I encourage you to have a look. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to Higher Journeys Radio. I'm your host, Alexis Brooks.